Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you once again to Eternal Darkness. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the tale. But before that, please consider giving us a like. We would truly appreciate it. The first warning signs came the night before, though I didn't recognize them at the time. I'd set up camp at Heart Mountain Hot Springs, just as dusk was settling in, my tent perched on one of the elevated sites that overlooked the Western Access Road. The location gave me a perfect view of the surrounding fields, the winding creek below, and the three steaming thermal pools that drew visitors to this remote corner of the refuge. As darkness fell, the usual evening sounds began to fade, but not in their normal pattern. The crickets, which typically chirped well into the night, went silent all at once, as if someone had flipped a switch. The pack of coyotes that normally howled from the ridge to the east never made a sound. Even the wind died completely, leaving an unnatural stillness that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Around midnight, I heard something moving through the campsite next to mine. Heavy footsteps, too deliberate to be a deer, too heavy for a human. I lay perfectly still in my sleeping bag, listening as whatever it was circled the perimeter of my camp three times before moving off toward the creek. I told myself it was just a bear, though I'd never known a bear to move with such purpose, such precision. I woke to a gray pre-dawn light and a pressing need to use the restroom facilities about a hundred yards from my campsite. The air felt wrong, dense and electric like the moments before a severe storm. Steam rose from the hot springs in thick coils, creating shadowy shapes that seemed to move with purpose through the morning mist. The first step out of my tent sent a jolt of adrenaline through my system. The ground was covered in dead crickets, hundreds of them, arranged in perfect concentric circles around my tent. They weren't crushed or mangled. They looked as if they'd simply stopped living all at once. I wanted to retreat back into my tent, to wait for full daylight, but my need for the restroom had become urgent. I started down the path, every sense hyper alert. The morning silence pressed against my ears like a physical weight. No birds called, no squirrels chattered. Even the creek seemed muted, its usual burble reduced to a whisper. The steam from the hot springs had grown thicker creating a wall of white that obscured everything beyond 50 feet. That's when I saw it. Through a gap in the mist about 200 feet away, something moved across the open area near the western campsites. My mind tried to categorize it as a horse, the brown, glossy coat, the black mane, but even as I formed that thought, I knew it was wrong. The proportions were off, the movement too deliberate. I froze mid-step, primal instinct screaming at me to remain motionless. The creature paused, and in that moment I realized its true size. Using the concrete fire pit as a reference, the being had to be at least eight feet tall. Its muscular definition rippled beneath that glossy coat in ways that defied natural anatomy. Then it turned its head. The movement was smooth but wrong like watching a video played slightly too fast. Its neck rotated a full 180 degrees, bringing its face toward me with mechanical precision. The eyes caught the morning light and reflected it back in a pale greenish glow that no known animal possesses. We locked gazes, and in that moment, I felt a consciousness studying me with an intelligence that was decidedly inhuman. What happened next sent ice through my veins. The creature's body began to shift, not in the violent, bone-cracking way of horror movies, but with a fluid grace that was somehow more terrifying. Its forelegs lengthened, spine straightened, and in three heartbeats, it stood upright on two legs. The transformation was so smooth, so natural, that it suggested this was its true form all along. The being now stood fully bipedal, easily eight feet tall, its arms hanging at its sides with fingers that seemed too long, too jointed. Its mane had become something like hair, flowing down its back in a way that defied the still morning air. It took a step toward me, 
its gait a perfect mimicry of human movement, but with a fluidity that made my stomach turn. I broke and ran, all thoughts of the restroom forgotten. Behind me I heard it move, not the crash of pursuit I expected, but a swift, silent motion that I felt more than heard. I risked a glance over my shoulder and immediately wished I hadn't. The creature covered ground with impossible speed, each stride eating up twice the distance a human could manage, its arms swinging in perfect counterbalance to its steps. I reached my campsite and dove into my tent, yanking the zipper closed behind me. Outside, the footsteps approached, slow, deliberate, circling. The morning light cast a shadow on my tent wall, showing a silhouette that seemed to constantly shift and change, never settling on one definite shape. The shadow paused at my tent's entrance. I heard breathing, deep rhythmic sounds that mimicked human respiration, but with an underlying harmonic that made my teeth ache. Something touched the tent wall, a gentle pressure that left five distinct impressions in the fabric. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the presence withdrew. I heard footsteps moving toward the creek, followed by a sound like rushing wind, though the air remained perfectly still. When I finally gathered the courage to unzip the tent, there was no sign of the creature, just a lingering scent of ozone and wet leather, and a set of impressions in the ground that didn't match any known animal. I broke camp in record time, my hands shaking so badly I could barely roll my sleeping bag. As I threw my gear into my truck, I noticed other campers emerging from their tents, all of them looking shaken. An older man at the next site caught my eye and gave me a knowing nod. You saw it too? He asked quietly. I nodded, unable to find words. Been coming here twenty years, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. It shows up every few seasons. Rangers won't talk about it. Best to pack up and come back another time. I didn't need to be told twice. As I drove away, I caught one last glimpse in my rearview mirror, a tall, dark figure standing at the tree line, watching my departure with that same fluid stillness I'd witnessed earlier. When I blinked, it was gone, leaving me to question everything I thought I knew about the natural world. The incident didn't end with my escape. That night, and for many nights after, I woke to the sound of breathing outside my bedroom window. That same rhythmic pattern with its bone-shaking undertone. But that's another story entirely, one I'm still not ready to tell. The shrill ring of my phone pierced the darkness at 3.17 a.m., sending my heart racing before my mind fully registered what was happening. I fumbled for the device, knocking over a half-empty glass of whiskey on my nightstand. The amber liquid spread across case files I'd been reviewing before finally succumbing to exhaustion just hours earlier. The files were part of an ever-growing collection that had taken over not just my desk, but my entire life. Missing persons reports, geological surveys, classified documents that I wasn't supposed to have. Each page represented another piece of a puzzle that I'd been trying to solve for months, another thread in a tapestry of disappearances that defied conventional explanation. The whiskey had become a nightly ritual, a futile attempt to quiet the theories that kept me awake long past midnight, to dull the edge of guilt that came with knowing I might have prevented some of these disappearances if I'd only connected the dots sooner. Detective Nakamura, I mumbled, trying to focus my bleary eyes on the ceiling of my sparse apartment. The yellow stains from years of previous tenants' cigarette smoke formed abstract patterns in the dim light filtering through thin curtains. These stains had become familiar companions during my sleepless nights, their shapes morphing into faces and figures that seemed to mock my inability to crack this case. My apartment had once been just a place to sleep between shifts, but now it had transformed into a command center of sorts, walls covered in maps and photographs, string connecting points that only I could see. The air was stale with the scent of cold coffee and takeout containers, testament to how little time I spent anywhere else these days. 
Detective, it's Chief Tanaka. His voice carried an edge I'd rarely heard in our 15 years working together. The Chief was usually unflappable, even during our worst cases. We'd weathered serial killers, political corruption, and organized crime together, but this case had changed him too. I could hear it in the slight tremor of his voice, the way he hesitated before delivering news he knew would drag me deeper into this nightmare. Our relationship had evolved from superior and subordinate to something more complex. He was one of the few who believed my theories about what was really happening in Aokigahara Forest, even if he couldn't officially support my investigation. We've got another one. My stomach clenched at these four simple words, each syllable landing like a physical blow. In 20 years on the force, I'd never encountered a case like this. Three weeks ago, 17-year-old Amiko Suzuki vanished while hiking with friends in Aokigahara Forest. The dense woodland at Mount Fuji's base had already claimed too many lives over the years, its reputation as a suicide forest earning it a dark place in Japanese folklore. But this was different. Amiko hadn't gone there to die. She had been full of life, her social media accounts bursting with plans for university, photos with friends, dreams of becoming a marine biologist. The forest had taken her anyway, adding her name to a growing list that only I seemed to recognize as connected. Location? I asked, already knowing the answer as I swung my legs over the bed's edge. The floor was cold against my bare feet, the chill seeping through my bones like a premonition. My toes curled against the hardwood seeking warmth that wasn't there much like I'd been seeking answers that seemed to slip further away with each new disappearance. Same area, a girl named Yumi Tanaka, no relation. He paused and I heard him take a deep breath, the static of the phone line crackling like distant thunder. She's 16, hero, same profile as Amiko, good student, loving family, no signs of depression or suicidal ideation. She was with three friends on a night hike some kind of courage test. The others say she just vanished. The words hung in the air between us, heavy with implication. We both knew this wasn't coincidence anymore, if it ever had been. I grabbed my wrinkled shirt from the back of my chair, phone pressed between ear and shoulder. The fabric smelled of stale coffee and cigarettes, though I'd quit smoking months ago. Old habits died hard, especially when cases like this kept dragging you back into the darkness. The friends being held? At the station. They're terrified, Hero. This isn't like our usual missing persons. Something's wrong here. Really wrong. The chief's voice dropped lower, almost conspiratorial. One of them keeps talking about sounds that shouldn't be there. About fog that moved against the wind. I know how it sounds, but... He trailed off, leaving the unspoken question hanging. How many more would we lose before we found the truth? The rescue operation made international headlines, though the true story never came out. The official version blamed a cult that had brainwashed vulnerable teenagers, a convenient narrative that played into existing fears while hiding the government's culpability. In sterile hospital rooms across Tokyo, the recovered girls struggled to piece together memories that seemed more like dreams. Their parents clutched hands and whispered prayers of gratitude, never knowing that their daughters had been victims not of human malice, but of something far more insidious, the arrogance of scientific ambition unleashed without restraint. Dr. Matsuda's data helped develop a treatment protocol, her guilt manifesting in endless hours spent fine-tuning frequencies to counteract the damage done. Most of the victims eventually recovered, their minds slowly emerging from the fog that had enslaved them. The Defense Ministry buried Project Echo deeper than the facility itself, and the entrance was sealed with enough concrete to ensure it would never be found again. But in my dreams, I still see the underground chambers, the walls lined with equipment that hummed with malevolent purpose the screens displaying wavelengths that seemed to pulse with their own dark intelligence. But sometimes, late at night, I still wake to the sound of my phone ringing. And before I answer, 
I wonder if this time it will be another call about another missing girl, about another frequency we didn't quite contain, about another horror we created in our endless quest to control the human mind. The ringtone seems to echo differently now, as if carrying harmonics that weren't there before, frequencies that dance just below the threshold of consciousness. They've assigned me to a desk job now, buried in the bureaucracy of the department's cold case division. Too many questions about my methods, they said. Too many classified files accessed without proper authorization. My new office is windowless, the fluorescent lights casting the same sickly green glow as the emergency lighting in that underground facility. But I keep tracking the patterns, missing persons reports, mysterious sounds, unexplained behaviors. Each new case file gets scrutinized for the telltale signs I've learned to recognize. Witnesses describing unusual acoustic phenomena, electromagnetic equipment malfunctions, inexplicable compulsions to walk into dark places. The forest has been closed to the public, officially for environmental preservation. New signs warn of dangerous terrain and unstable ground, their bright red characters stark against metal backgrounds that seem to vibrate in certain lights. But I've seen the satellite images, watched the clearing grow larger year by year, as if something below is still calling, still hungry, still waiting. The vegetation grows differently there now, patterns emerging that don't follow natural growth cycles. Sometimes when I study the aerial photographs late at night, I swear I can see shapes in the canopy, like ripples in a pond where something vast moves beneath the surface. And sometimes on quiet nights, I drive out to the forest's edge and listen. The frequencies are supposed to be contained, but I know better. I can feel them pulsing through the ground, through the trees, through the air itself. A legacy of human arrogance, a weapon we created but never truly controlled, now hunting on its own. The car's electronics act strangely this close to the forest radio stations blur together. The GPS stutters and loses signal. My phone displays random patterns of numbers that disappear when I try to photograph them. Even the air feels different here, thicker somehow, as if the very atmosphere is being compressed and manipulated by forces we barely understand. Because in the end, the real horror wasn't in the supernatural at all. It was in what we did to ourselves, in the name of progress, in the name of power. The true monster wasn't some ancient evil lurking in the shadows, but the modern evil we created in sterile labs with government funding and good intentions. And somewhere in that forest, beneath the twisted trees and volcanic rock, our creation is still evolving, still calling, still waiting for those who can hear its silent song. The frequencies multiply and mutate, finding new resonances, new ways to reach into human minds and pull the strings we never knew were there. I keep the phone by my bed, knowing that someday it will ring again. The ringtone I've chosen is a specific frequency, one that Dr. Matsuda helped me select, designed to cut through the electromagnetic interference that seems to grow stronger each year, because some frequencies never die. They just change their tune and find new ways to make us dance to their rhythm of horror. And when that call comes, I'll be ready, armed with knowledge bought at too high a price, prepared to face whatever new mutation our arrogance has spawned. After all, we created this horror. Now it's our responsibility to contain it, if such a thing is even possible anymore. Looking back on that Saturday morning in 2015, I still get chills thinking about how quickly an innocent hiking trip turned into a nightmare. The funny thing about trauma is how it etches certain details into your memory with devastating clarity, while others fade into a hazy blur. I remember the exact shade of orange the sunrise painted across the Arizona sky as we drove to the trailhead. I remember the earthy smell of rain on desert soil and I remember with painful precision the hollow look in that woman's eyes when she held that box cutter to my friend's throat. 
I had been working at Desert Sun Technologies in Flagstaff for about five years then, alongside my wife Sarah and our friends Jake Martinez and Tabitha Tabby Chen. The four of us made an unlikely group, me in accounting, Sarah in HR, Jake in IT, and Tabby in marketing. But we'd grown close over countless lunch breaks and after work happy hours. Getting all of us off work at the same time was like trying to align planets. Our departments ran on completely different schedules, and someone was always covering a shift or dealing with a crisis. So when we realized we all had the same long weekend free in October, it felt like the universe was finally cutting us a break. Jake, an experienced hiker who'd tackled most of the major trails around Flagstaff, suggested we take advantage of the mild fall weather to explore a lesser known trail he'd discovered while researching online. The Echo Canyon Trail, he called it, promising stunning views and challenging terrain that would make for an unforgettable day trip. Sarah and I spent the week before the hike preparing. We dug out our hiking boots from the back of the closet, checked the weather forecast obsessively, and made multiple trips to REI for supplies we probably didn't need, but bought anyway. New moisture wicking socks, trail mix, a fancy first aid kit that Sarah insisted on. Looking back, the irony of all that careful preparation isn't lost on me. No amount of planning could have prepared us for what actually happened. We left Flagstaff at dawn the city still quiet except for a few early morning joggers and delivery trucks. Jake had offered to drive, his new SUV being the most suitable for the rough forest roads, but I insisted on taking my car. I've always been particular about driving. Something about being behind the wheel gives me a sense of control that I now realize was completely illusory. The drive started perfectly. Sarah had made thermoses of coffee for everyone, and Tabby brought her famous homemade banana bread. We spent the first hour sharing stories and making plans for future trips, all of us giddy with the prospect of a full day away from computer screens and fluorescent lights. Jake kept checking his phone's GPS, assuring us we were on track even as the paved roads gave way to gravel and the traffic thinned to nothing. The weather changed so suddenly it was almost theatrical. One minute we were driving under clear skies, and the next dark clouds rolled in like something out of a movie. The rain started as a drizzle, but quickly intensified into a torrential downpour that forced me to slow to a crawl, my windshield wipers barely keeping up with the deluge. We were debating whether to turn back when we saw her. The images burned into my memory. A slight figure standing beside my parked SUV, her clothes hanging in tatters her hair plastered to her skull by the rain. At first glance, she looked like a victim, someone in desperate need of help. But there was something off about her posture, something unnatural in the way she stood perfectly still despite the pounding rain. I remember shouting at her to get away from my car, more out of instinct than anger. She didn't react at all. No startled jump, no defensive posture, nothing just that empty stare that seemed to look through us rather than at us. Sarah's hand on my arm stopped me from yelling again. She needs help, my wife whispered, though I could hear the uncertainty in her voice. The decision to let her into our car was a collective one, made in that split second when basic human decency overrode our growing sense of unease. Sarah moved to the middle seat, and Tabby scooted over to make room for the stranger. The woman's silence was oppressive, filling the car with a tension that made it hard to breathe. She smelled of wet earth and something else, something chemical that I couldn't quite identify. Looking back, there were so many warning signs, the way she never blinked, the slight twitch in her left hand, the fact that despite being soaked to the bone, she wasn't shivering. But we were all too focused on doing the right thing, on being good Samaritans, to see the danger until it was too late. The scream came without warning, a sound that started as human but morphed into something feral and unhinged. I remember the feeling of the wheel jerking in my hands as the car slid on the wet road. Remember the sickening lurch as we went into the ditch, 
Remember the moment of perfect silence before her laughter started. That laugh. God, that laugh. It wasn't the maniacal cackling you hear in horror movies. It was empty, hollow, like the sound was coming from somewhere deep underground. When she pulled out the box cutter, the blade caught what little light there was, gleaming dully against Tabby's throat. The police report reads like fiction now. Armed robbery by unknown female suspect, approximately 25, 30 years old, Caucasian, medium build. It doesn't mention how Jake's hand shook for hours afterward, or how Tabby had a panic attack at the gas station, or how Sarah couldn't sleep without the lights on for months. It doesn't mention how I spent weeks afterward compulsively checking local crime reports and missing persons databases, trying to make sense of what happened. We never went hiking again as a group. Jake moved to Phoenix six months later, claiming it was for a better job opportunity, but we all knew he needed to get away from the memories. Tabby transferred to our company's Seattle office. Sarah and I stayed in Flagstaff, but something changed between us. We became more cautious, more suspicious. The easy trust we once had in strangers disappeared. Sometimes, on rainy days, I find myself thinking about her. Not about the violence or the theft, but about those empty eyes and that horrible laugh. I wonder if she was once normal, if there was a chain of events that turned her into whatever we encountered that day. I wonder if she's still out there, waiting by the side of some lonely road for another group of well-meaning people to stop and offer help. It's been eight years since that day, and I still struggle to make sense of it. The rational part of my mind says she was probably just a desperate person, maybe addicted to drugs, maybe mentally ill, who saw an opportunity and took it. But there's another part of me, a part that remembers the unnatural stillness of her stance in the rain, the inhuman quality of her scream, that wonders if we encountered something else that day, something that just happened to be wearing human shape. I've learned to live with the uncertainty, but I've also learned to trust my instincts, that nagging feeling I had when we first saw her. I listen to those feelings now. Some might call it paranoia. I call it survival. The world isn't always what it seems, and sometimes the most dangerous monsters are the ones that look just human enough to make us lower our guard. If there's a lesson in all of this, maybe it's about the fine line between compassion and caution, between helping others and protecting ourselves. I don't regret trying to help. I don't think any of us do. But I do wonder about all the little moments where we ignored our intuition all the warning signs we chose not to see. The next time you're driving on a rainy day and see someone who needs help, I hope you'll remember this story. Not as a reason to turn away from those in genuine need, but as a reminder that sometimes our first instincts, that gut feeling that something isn't quite right, deserve more attention than our desire to be good Samaritans. Because sometimes, the rain isn't the most dangerous thing on the road. Three years after the incident, I received a strange email from Jake. He'd been working security at his new tech firm in Phoenix, and during a routine check of surveillance footage, he saw something that made his blood run cold. A woman matching our attacker's description had been caught on camera walking through their parking garage at 3 a.m. She moved with that same unnatural stillness, wearing clothes that seemed decades old, but when security went to investigate, they found nothing. Just a puddle of water on the concrete floor, despite there having been no rain for weeks. Tabby had her own story. In Seattle, she'd heard rumors about a rain woman who appeared during storms, asking strangers for help. The descriptions were eerily similar. The matted hair, the vacant eyes, the tattered clothes. But these stories spanned decades and the woman never seemed to age. I've spent countless hours researching similar incidents across the Southwest. Most are easily dismissed as urban legends or misidentified encounters with homeless individuals. But a few stand out, too specific, too similar to our experience to be coincidence. A group of college students in New Mexico in 1985. 
a family in Colorado in 1997, a tour bus in Nevada in 2008, all reporting the same woman, the same modus operandi, the same hollow laugh. Sarah thinks I'm obsessed, and maybe I am. But how do you move on when the fundamental rules of reality have been called into question? How do you tell yourself it was just a random encounter when every instinct screams that it was something more? These days I keep a journal of similar incidents, cross-referencing dates, locations, and descriptions. The pattern that emerges is both fascinating and terrifying. The attacks seem to cluster around periods of unusual weather patterns, particularly sudden storms in otherwise clear conditions. They often occur near areas with historical significance, old trade routes, abandoned mining towns, places where the boundary between civilization and wilderness blurs. I've learned to live with the uncertainty, but I've also learned to be prepared. Our car now has security cameras, and we never pick up strangers, no matter how desperate they appear. Some might call it paranoid. I call it practical. When you've glimpsed something beyond the ordinary, you can never quite go back to seeing the world the same way. Sarah and I still live in Flagstaff, though we've moved to a busier part of town. We've rebuilt our lives around this new reality, this understanding that the world is stranger and more dangerous than we once believed. Jake calls occasionally from Phoenix, and Tabby sends emails from Seattle, but we never discuss that day directly. Some experiences create a bond that doesn't need words. I'm sharing this story not to discourage acts of kindness or to promote paranoia, but as a warning to trust your instincts. That nagging feeling when something seems off, that's millions of years of evolution trying to keep you alive. Listen to it. If you're driving on a lonely road and see someone who needs help, by all means, stop. But call the authorities first. Keep your doors locked until help arrives. Watch for the signs we missed. Unnatural stillness, empty eyes, behavior that doesn't quite match the situation. And if you ever find yourself in the rain, far from civilization, and see a woman standing by your car, remember this story. Remember that not all predators have claws, and not all monsters hide in the darkness. Sometimes they stand in plain sight, waiting for someone kind enough to let them in. Some of my fondest memories as a child revolved around Girl Scouts, though not in the way most might expect. While other girls remember selling cookies or earning badges, I remember the quiet moments with my mother, her careful hands pinning new achievements to my uniform. Looking back, I wonder if these memories stand out so vividly because I lost her too soon, or if they're simply etched deeper because of my innate passion for learning. Either way, the Girl Scouts became more than just an after-school activity. It became a thread that would weave through my entire life, eventually leading me to that fateful day in the woods. Even without children of my own, I remained deeply involved with the organization well into adulthood. There was something comforting about giving back, about creating the same kind of safe space for young girls that I once had. I became known as the volunteer who always went the extra mile, the one who'd spend her own money on special snacks and craft supplies, who'd research alternative activities for the girls who, like my younger self, weren't quite ready for the more adventurous aspects of scouting. That particular camping trip started like any other. We had our usual mix of troop leaders, mostly mothers and dedicated volunteers like myself, and a group of excited girls ready for their woodland adventure. The morning air was crisp, holding that peculiar September sweetness that makes you believe anything is possible. We began with our traditional first day hike, partly to help the girls burn off their nervous energy and partly to familiarize them with their surroundings. The trail we chose was well marked and frequently traveled, exactly what you'd want for a group of young scouts. I remember checking my watch as we set out, 9.15 a.m. The sun was still climbing, casting long shadows through the trees, 
and the girls chatted excitedly about the weekend ahead. I was walking near the back of the group, making sure no one fell behind when it happened. The silence hit me like a physical force. One moment, the forest was alive with birdsong and children's laughter. The next, it was as if someone had stuffed cotton in my ears. The pressure built in my sinuses until all I could hear was a high-pitched buzzing. When my senses finally cleared seconds later, I immediately knew something was wrong. Cindy was gone. She had been walking just a few feet ahead of me. I was certain of it. A quiet, thoughtful child with wire-rimmed glasses and dark hair always neatly braided, Cindy wasn't the type to wander off. My heart began to race as I quickly moved through the line of girls, calling her name with forced casualness. When I reached Susan, another volunteer, the look of concern on her face must have mirrored my own. We immediately organized a search, trying to maintain calm while fighting back our growing panic. Five minutes passed like an eternity. We were just about to call the authorities when someone spotted her. Cindy walking casually through the trees as if she'd just stepped away for a moment. The relief that flooded through me quickly gave way to confusion. She seemed different. The usually reserved girl was humming to herself, a strange smile playing at the corners of her mouth. What put you in such a good mood? I asked trying to keep my voice light as I checked her for any signs of injury. Her response made my blood run cold. The friend I made in the woods, they warned me about the man in the red cave. I pressed her for details, asking if anyone had touched her or hurt her, but she just kept smiling that unsettling smile. Everything circled back to that warning. Stay away from the man in the red cave. To this day, I can't remember all the questions I asked or her exact responses. I just remember the goosebumps that refused to fade, the prickling sensation at the back of my neck that wouldn't go away. That night sleep evaded me. I drifted in and out of consciousness, my dreams filled with shadowy figures and crimson-stained stone walls. I tried to convince myself that it was just a child's imagination at work. After all, wasn't that what the woods did to young minds? Create monsters from shadows and adventures from empty spaces? I managed to push the incident to the back of my mind as the years passed. Life went on, and the strange encounter became nothing more than a peculiar memory, until we returned to those same woods years later. I might never have remembered at all if it hadn't been for that night, sitting outside the tents, when I noticed a young girl stirring restlessly. When I asked if she was all right, her response chilled me to my core. My friend keeps waking me up, telling me I need to go see the man in the red cave. I never returned to that camping spot after that weekend. Some things I've learned are better left undisturbed. But sometimes on quiet nights when sleep won't come, I find myself wondering about that red cave, about the friends in the woods and about what might have happened if either girl had heeded their call. The decision to go back didn't come easily. For months after that second incident, I tried to convince myself it was all coincidence, two overactive imaginations in a suggestible setting. But the similarity was too precise, too specific. The man in the red cave, those exact words years apart from two different children who had never met, I started my research quietly, not wanting to alarm anyone. Local history became my obsession. I spent countless evenings in the town library, poring over old newspapers and town records. The forest itself had a fairly mundane history, typical tales of logging disputes and land ownership changes. But then I found something in a yellowed copy of the local paper from 1932 a small article about three children who had gone missing in those woods. They were found three days later, unharmed but confused, talking about a friendly woman who had warned them about a cave. The article didn't mention the color red, but it was enough to send chills down my spine. I knew I couldn't go alone. After careful consideration, I reached out to Sarah, another volunteer who had been present for the second incident. 
She had always been the practical one, the voice of reason. When I showed her my research and explained my plans, I expected skepticism. Instead, she went quiet for a long moment. I never told anyone this, she finally said. But my grandmother used to tell stories about those woods, about things that weren't quite right. She called them the hollow people, said they looked human but weren't, and they liked to lead people astray. Together, we spent two months planning our return. We gathered supplies, high-powered flashlights, emergency flares, first aid kits, GPS devices, and satellite phones. We mapped every known trail and marked the locations where both incidents had occurred. We even took wilderness survival courses, though we planned to stay only during daylight hours. The night before our planned expedition, I barely slept. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw Cindy's strange smile, heard the second girl's words about her friend. What were we really walking into? The morning dawned clear and cold. Sarah and I arrived at the parking area just as the sun was cresting the trees. The forest looked different somehow, less like a recreational area and more like something ancient and aware. The air felt thick, almost resistant, as we shouldered our packs. We started by retracing the original hiking trail. Everything looked normal at first. Birds calling, squirrels scampering through the canopy, the occasional rustle of larger wildlife moving away from our approach. But as we neared the area where Cindy had disappeared, the forest began to change. The first thing I noticed was the silence. Not the artificial silence I'd experienced years ago, but a gradual dampening of sound as if we were walking into an increasingly dense fog. The temperature dropped noticeably, and the undergrowth became thicker, wilder. Look at this, Sarah called, pointing to a cluster of mushrooms growing in a perfect circle. Inside the ring, the grass was darker, almost black. We both stared at it, neither wanting to be the first to say what we were thinking. That's when we heard the humming. The sound was distant but clear a melody that seemed familiar but impossible to place. It drifted through the trees, never getting louder or softer, no matter which direction we moved. Sarah gripped my arm, her fingers digging in. Do you see that? she whispered. Through the trees ahead, something red gleamed. Not the organic red of berries or autumn leaves, but something darker, more artificial. We approached slowly, our feet silent on the thick carpet of leaves. As we drew closer, the red resolved into a smooth surface, rock face stained with what looked like iron oxide, forming a stark contrast against the surrounding forest. The cave entrance was small, barely large enough to walk through upright. The humming seemed to emanate from within, though it was impossible to pinpoint its source. Our flashlight beams revealed worn steps leading down into darkness, clearly man-made but ancient. We should go back, Sarah said, but her voice lacked conviction. We both knew we'd come too far to turn around now. The steps descended for what felt like hours but was probably only minutes. The air grew colder, damper. Our flashlights revealed strange markings on the walls, not graffiti or native pictographs, but something else. Geometric patterns that seemed to shift when viewed directly flowing like liquid when caught in our peripheral vision. The tunnel eventually opened into a chamber, and that's where we found them. Dozens of small objects arranged in careful patterns on natural stone shelves. Toys, mostly. Old ones. A tin soldier from the 1940s. A Raggedy Ann doll missing one eye. A Game Boy Color caked with dirt. Each item had a small paper tag attached with a child's name and a date. Some of the dates went back over a hundred years. We were so focused on the objects that we didn't notice the temperature had dropped dramatically until we could see our breath. The humming, which had become background noise, suddenly stopped. In its place came a sound like dry leaves scraping against stone. I turned, raising my flashlight, and that's when I saw it. The being in the doorway was roughly human-shaped, but wrong in ways my mind struggled to process. It seemed to be made of shadows that had learned to hold their shape, with depths where eyes should be that reflected our flashlight beams like a cat's. 
but it was the smile that broke me. Too wide, too many teeth stretching literally from ear to ear. You shouldn't be here, it said in a voice like rustling papers. This isn't for you. This is for the children. Sarah screamed. I grabbed her hand and we ran, deeper into the cave system because the creature was blocking our exit. Behind us we could hear it moving. Not footsteps, but a dry sliding sound that seemed to come from all directions. We ran through tunnels that shouldn't have been there, past more chambers filled with toys and treasures. The creature's voice followed us, sometimes distant, sometimes so close it seemed to whisper in our ears. We keep them safe. We warn them. About him. Always about him. The hungry one. The red one. The tunnels began to slope upward. Our flashlight beams caught movements at the edge of their reach. Other shapes, other beings, all wrong in their own unique ways. Some seemed to be made of mist, others of twisted shadows or fragmented light. Finally, we saw natural light ahead. We burst out of a cave opening into bright sunlight, an exit we hadn't known existed, one that shouldn't have been possible given the direction we'd run. Behind us, the voices faded. Remember to warn them about the red one. Always warn them. The following weeks were a blur of nightmares and sleepless nights. We'd emerged miles from our original location, our GPS devices showing impossible readings. The cave entrance we'd exited from seemed to vanish when we tried to find it again later. Sarah moved away shortly after, saying she needed a fresh start somewhere with fewer trees. I understood. I started having panic attacks whenever I saw mushroom rings or red rocks. The worst part was knowing that something was still out there, still luring children, still warning them about something even worse than itself. Over the years, I've collected similar stories. A Boy Scout troop in Vermont who all shared the same dream about a shadow lady warning them about a red door. A school camping trip in Oregon where half the children reported making friends with the quiet people who lived in the trees. Each story had the same elements creatures that weren't quite right, warnings about something worse, and always, always the color red. I still volunteer with the Girl Scouts, but never for overnight camping trips. Sometimes, when I'm helping with badges or craft projects, I'll catch a girl looking off into the distance, humming a tune I almost recognize, and my blood runs cold, because now I understand what we encountered in those caves. They weren't the monsters. They were the guardians, the watchers, the ones trying to protect children from something far worse, something that lives in red places and wears a human shape like an ill-fitting suit, something that's still out there, still hungry, still waiting. And sometimes on very quiet nights, I can still hear that humming. It sounds like a warning. I never thought I'd be telling this story. Even now, years later, my hands shake slightly as I type these words. The events that unfolded in the Cascade Mountains during the summer of 2019 fundamentally changed who I am, how I view the world, and my relationship with the wilderness I once loved so deeply. Growing up in Portland, Oregon, I was practically raised on hiking trails. My parents were avid outdoors people. Mom was an environmental scientist and dad worked as a park ranger. Weekends meant backpacking trips, learning to identify plants, and listening to dad's endless lectures about respecting nature. By the time I was 12, I could start a fire in the rain, identify edible plants, and navigate using just a map and compass. The mountains were my second home. During college, I joined the hiking club and eventually became its president. I led weekend expeditions, taught wilderness survival courses, and spent every summer break working seasonal jobs in various national parks. My reputation as an experienced guide led to a position at Silver Pine Lodge, an upscale resort nestled in a remote corner of the Cascades. The job seemed perfect, working as both a hiking guide and lifeguard, with access to miles of pristine wilderness trails. The resort itself was an interesting place. 
Built in the 1920s as a luxury retreat for wealthy Seattleites, it had that classic Pacific Northwest Lodge architecture. All heavy timber and stone, with a grand central building surrounded by scattered private cabins. The property sprawled across nearly 200 acres, backing up against national forest land. Most guests came for the isolation and scenery, spending their days hiking, fishing, or simply relaxing by the lake. I quickly fell into a comfortable routine that first month. Mornings were spent leading guided hikes along the easier trails, afternoons lifeguarding at the pool, and evenings either helping with resort activities or exploring the more challenging trails on my own. The other staff members became like family. There was Maria who ran the front desk and knew every guest story. Old Jack who'd maintained the grounds for 30 years and could predict the weather better than any forecast. And Sarah from the kitchen who always saved me extra dessert. It was during these early weeks that I also met the core group of local hiking enthusiasts who would become both my closest friends and unwitting participants in the horror that was to come. There was Mike, a geology graduate student studying the region's volcanic history. Lisa, a wildlife photographer who seemed to have a sixth sense for tracking animals. And Tom, a retired forest service worker who knew every trail and off-trail route within 50 miles. We would often meet up for sunset hikes after my shifts, sharing stories and gradually exploring deeper into the surrounding wilderness. They taught me about the area's history, both natural and human. The indigenous peoples who had lived here for millennia, the logging operations that had briefly scarred the land in the 1800s, and the local legends that still circulated among longtime residents. One particular story, shared by Tom on a chilly evening around a campfire, would later take on a haunting significance. He spoke of traditional warnings about certain parts of the forest, places where the trees grew wrong and animals wouldn't go, places that the original inhabitants of this land had marked with warning signs, most of which had been lost to time. At the time, I dismissed it as just another piece of local folklore. How wrong I was. Looking back, I can see how all of these elements, my experience, my newfound friends, the remote location, and those ancient warnings were like pieces of a puzzle slowly coming together. The stage was being set for something that would challenge everything I thought I knew about the natural world and my place in it. The idea for the fatal hike came from Mike. He discovered references to an unmarked waterfall in some old survey documents and became convinced he could locate it. The coordinates placed it about seven miles from the resort, in a densely forested valley that few people ever visited. The trail would be challenging, a combination of established paths and off-trail navigation through rough terrain. I spent weeks preparing, studying topographical maps and satellite imagery, plotting potential routes, and marking natural landmarks we could use for navigation. The area was notorious for poor GPS reception due to the steep valley walls and dense tree cover. We would need to rely on traditional navigation methods. Lisa contributed her expertise as well, marking known animal migration paths and suggesting the best time to avoid encounters with the local bear and cougar populations. Tom provided historical context, showing us where old logging roads might provide easier passage though many would be overgrown after decades of disuse. We planned the trip meticulously. The weather forecast showed a clear window in late August, perfect conditions for hiking. Our gear lists were comprehensive, emergency beacons, first aid supplies, extra layers, and enough food and water for an extended stay if something went wrong. I even left a detailed route plan with Maria at the front desk, something that would later prove crucial. The night before the hike, we gathered in my cabin to finalize preparations. The mood was excited but focused. Mike spread his maps across the table, tracing our intended route with his finger. Lisa checked and double-checked our gear. Tom shared a few final pieces of advice about the terrain. None of us noticed how the crickets outside had fallen silent, or how the evening mist seemed to curl unnaturally around the cabin's windows. We were too caught up in our preparations, 
too confident in our abilities and experience. We had no way of knowing that we were about to step into something far beyond our understanding. We set out at dawn, the morning air crisp and heavy with dew. The first few miles followed established trails, winding through old-growth forest where shafts of early sunlight painted the moss-covered trees in shades of gold and green. The familiar scents of cedar and pine filled the air, along with the gentle sound of wind through the canopy high above. Our conversation flowed easily at first, Mike explaining the geological formations we passed, Lisa pointing out fresh animal signs, Tom sharing stories about his years in the Forest Service. I remember feeling completely at peace, totally in my element. The weight of my pack, the rhythm of our footsteps, the gradual warming of the day, everything felt right. Around mid-morning, we left the marked trail following one of the old logging roads Tom had identified. The change was subtle at first. The path became less distinct, overcome by decades of natural growth. The forest around us grew denser, the trees closer together. The morning light that had been so bright earlier now seemed to struggle to reach the forest floor. It was during our first rest break that I noticed something odd. The bird songs that had accompanied our morning hike had grown fewer and fainter. Lisa noticed it too. She was used to photographing the area's rich wildlife, but now she commented on the unusual silence. Even the smaller animals, the squirrels and chipmunks that normally scurried through the underbrush, seemed absent. Mike was too excited about our progress to pay much attention to these subtle changes. According to his calculations, we were making good time toward the waterfall's suspected location. But Tom had grown quiet, his usual steady stream of stories replaced by watchful silence. When I caught his eye, he gave me a look I couldn't quite interpret, something between concern and recognition, as if he was remembering something he'd rather forget. The terrain grew increasingly challenging as we pushed forward. The old logging road had completely disappeared, leaving us to navigate through thick undergrowth and over fallen trees. The forest floor was covered in a thick layer of moss that seemed to muffle our footsteps. The air had grown noticeably cooler, despite the summer sun that we could occasionally glimpse through the dense canopy. It was early afternoon when we came across the first sign that something was wrong. We were crossing a small stream when Lisa called us over to look at something. There, half buried in the soft earth of the bank, was an old stone marker. It was clearly carved by human hands, but the symbols were unlike anything I'd seen before. Tom's face went pale when he saw it. He muttered something about boundary markers and suggested we turn back but Mike insisted we were too close to our goal to give up now. Looking back, I wish we'd heeded Tom's warning, but we pressed on, leaving the stream and its mysterious marker behind. The forest seemed to close in around us as we walked, the trees growing closer together, their branches interweaving overhead until barely any light penetrated the canopy. The temperature continued to drop, and an unnatural mist began to gather around our feet. That's when we heard it, a sound that didn't belong in these woods, a low rhythmic thudding, like distant drums, coming from somewhere ahead of us. We all stopped, listening intently. The sound faded away as quickly as it had come, leaving us in silence more absolute than before. Mike convinced us it was probably just the echo of our own movements bouncing off the valley walls. Lisa wasn't so sure, but she kept her doubts to herself. Tom said nothing, but I noticed his hand had moved to the hunting knife at his belt. As for me, I felt the first real stirring of fear, not the rational concern of an experienced hiker facing natural dangers, but something deeper and more primitive. We were about to step into something that would change our lives forever, and deep down I think we all knew it. The forest ahead seemed to watch us with ancient, patient malevolence, waiting for us to venture deeper into its domain. The first real sign of horror came when we reached a small clearing that shouldn't have existed. According to our maps, this entire area should have been dense forest, but instead, 
we found ourselves in a roughly circular space about 30 feet across. The trees around the clearing were wrong, their trunks twisted in impossible ways, branches reaching inward like grasping fingers. What stopped us in our tracks wasn't the clearing itself, but what we found at its center. There was a pile of stones arranged in a precise pattern, and scattered around it were dozens of small animal bones, bleached white by sun and time. They had been arranged in intricate patterns that seemed to shift and change when viewed from different angles. Lisa, with her extensive wildlife knowledge, couldn't identify many of the bones. Some appeared to belong to species that shouldn't have been in these mountains at all. Others seemed wrong, somehow, misshapen, as if they had belonged to creatures that weren't quite natural. Mike's scientific curiosity got the better of him, and he approached the stone formation for a closer look. That's when we heard the drums again, louder this time, and accompanied by a deep vibration we could feel through the soles of our boots. The air grew noticeably colder, and the mist that had been gathering all day suddenly thickened, swirling around our ankles in patterns that seemed almost deliberate. Tom grabbed Mike's arm before he could touch the stones, pulling him back with surprising force. We need to leave, he said, his voice tight with fear. Now! I'd never seen the old forest service worker so rattled. He kept looking at the trees around the clearing, and I realized with growing horror that their branches seemed to be moving, despite there being no wind. That's when we heard the whispers. They seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once, voices speaking in a language none of us recognized, yet somehow conveying a sense of ancient malevolence. The mist continued to thicken, and within it, shapes began to form and dissolve, suggestions of movement just at the edge of vision. We backed away from the stone formation, clustering together instinctively. The whispers grew louder, and with them came a smell, something ancient and wrong, like decay and ozone and something else I couldn't identify. The temperature dropped further and our breath began to fog in the air. Lisa was the first to spot it, a dark figure standing just inside the tree line, partially hidden behind one of the twisted trunks. It was tall, impossibly tall, its form seeming to shift and change as we stared at it. What I first took to be branches or antlers sprouting from its head began to move independently, reaching out into the air like tentacles. The creature we spotted began moving toward us with an unnatural gait. Each step it took seemed to ripple through the air like waves in water. The mist grew thicker around us, and the mysterious whispers intensified into a crescendo of otherworldly sounds. Our group huddled closer together, unable to look away from the approaching entity. What had seemed like branches or antlers from a distance now revealed themselves to be writhing appendages, constantly shifting and changing form. The temperature dropped so low that frost began forming on the surrounding vegetation. Mike, still clutching his research notes, whispered something about this matching old legends of forest spirits, ancient beings that guarded forbidden places. But this was no benevolent forest guardian. The malevolence radiating from it was palpable, like a physical force pressing against our minds. Tom, his face ashen, slowly reached for his hunting knife. Listen carefully, he whispered his voice barely audible over the strange sound surrounding us. When I say run, split up, head downhill, water, find water. His words made little sense at the moment, but his tone left no room for argument. The creature's movement suddenly accelerated, covering impossible distances in single strides. Its form seemed to flicker between states, sometimes solid, sometimes translucent, like smoke given partial substance. The appendages extending from its head reached out toward us, far longer than they should have been able to extend. What happened next is still difficult to describe. The entity emitted a sound that defied natural laws, a combination of frequencies that seemed to vibrate through our bodies and minds simultaneously. Lisa screamed, dropping her camera. The sound had physically affected her. Blood was trickling from her nose. I finally saw its face, if you could call it that. Where features should have been, 
there was instead a constantly shifting pattern of shadows and angles that hurt to look at directly. Its eyes were voids, not just dark, but absences of light itself, seeming to pull in everything around them. The thing spoke, not in words, but in sensations and images that burned themselves into our minds. Ancient forests, deep caves, things that moved in spaces between spaces, a hunger older than time itself. Tom's voice cut through the mental assault. Run! We scattered. I crashed through the underbrush, branches whipping at my face, my only thought to get away. Behind me, I could hear the others doing the same, along with sounds no earthly creature should make, a pursuing cacophony of impossible noises and movements. I remembered Tom's words about water and veered toward where I thought the stream should be. My lungs were burning, my legs trembling, but pure terror kept me moving. The mist swirled around me, sometimes taking shapes that I forced myself not to look at directly. Somehow I found the stream. Without hesitation, I splashed across it, nearly losing my footing on the slick rocks. As I reached the other side, the otherworldly sounds began to fade. Looking back, I saw the mist stopping at the water's edge, as if held back by an invisible barrier. One by one, the others found their way to the stream as well. We regrouped, shaking, bleeding from various cuts and scrapes, but alive. Mike had lost his backpack. Lisa's camera was gone. Tom's knife hand was burned, though he hadn't remembered using it. The nightmares began that very night. Each of us experienced them differently, but they shared common elements. The shifting form, those void-like eyes, the sensation of being hunted through endless dark woods. Sleep became a luxury none of us could fully trust. The physical effects lingered too. Lisa's nosebleeds continued for weeks. Mike developed a sensitivity to certain sounds that would send him into panic attacks. Tom's burned hand never fully healed, leaving a pattern of scars that seemed to shift when viewed from different angles. I found myself unable to return to work at the resort. The sight of the forest's edge would trigger intense anxiety attacks. Even the sound of wind through trees would sometimes send me into a cold sweat. My love for hiking and outdoor adventure had been replaced by a deep-seated fear of what might lurk in the wilderness. Over the following months, we began hearing similar stories from other parts of the mountains. Hikers reporting strange encounters, unexplained disappearances, sounds that couldn't be traced to any known source. Each account shared eerily familiar details, the mist, the whispers, the sense of ancient malevolence. We started documenting these incidents, creating a map of where they occurred. A pattern emerged. Most sightings happened near old stone markers, similar to the one we'd found. Tom's research into local indigenous histories revealed references to boundary stones that marked places where the veil between worlds was thin. Five years have passed since our encounter in those woods. On the surface, we've all moved on with our lives. Mike now teaches geology at a community college, carefully avoiding any mention of his experience. Lisa switched to studio photography. Tom retired early and moved to the city, but we stay in touch, sharing updates whenever similar incidents make the news. We've learned we're not alone. There's a whole community of people who've had encounters with things that shouldn't exist. Some spend their lives trying to prove what happened to them. Others, like us, simply try to cope with the knowledge that the world is far stranger and more dangerous than most people realize. I still can't bring myself to go hiking, but I've found a new purpose in helping others who've had similar experiences. Sometimes, late at night, I look at maps of those mountains and wonder about what we really saw that day. Was it something ancient, something that had always been there, or was it something that had found its way into our world from somewhere else? The answers don't really matter anymore. What matters is that we survived, and that we can help others understand they're not alone in what they've experienced. The wilderness still calls to me sometimes in dreams and memories, but now I know better than to answer. Some doors, once opened, can never be fully closed again.
The open road stretched before me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the vast American landscape. My loyal companion, a scruffy mutt with soulful eyes, sat contentedly in the passenger seat, his head hanging out the window as we cruised along. We were on a cross-country adventure, just the two of us, with Yellowstone National Park as our next destination. As we approached the park, my excitement grew. I had heard so much about its natural wonders, the geysers, hot springs, and diverse wildlife. The plan was simple. Find a campsite, set up for the night, and spend the next few days exploring this magnificent wilderness. The sun was already dipping low on the horizon when we finally reached the park entrance. After paying the entry fee and receiving a map from the ranger, I drove towards the first campground on my list. To my dismay, a large full sign greeted me at the entrance. No problem, I thought. There are plenty of other campgrounds in the park. Little did I know that this was just the beginning of a long and frustrating search. As I drove from one campground to another, the story remained the same. Every single site was occupied. The park was teeming with visitors, all eager to experience the beauty of Yellowstone during the peak season. I circled the park's main loop road multiple times, hoping that someone might have left early or that a last minute cancellation would open up a spot. With each passing minute, the sun sank lower painting the sky in vibrant hues of orange and pink. Under different circumstances, I would have marveled at the breathtaking sunset, but my growing concern about finding a place to sleep overshadowed its beauty. As darkness settled over the park, I realized I had to make a decision. The idea of sleeping in my car in a parking lot didn't appeal to me, especially with my furry friend in tow. That's when I remembered passing a secluded trailhead earlier. It wasn't an official campsite, but it seemed like the best option given the circumstances. With a mix of trepidation and determination, I steered my vehicle back to the trailhead. The parking lot was empty, which was both a relief and slightly unnerving. I quickly gathered my gear, strapping my frame pack to my back and ensuring I had all the essentials. Tent, sleeping bag, food, water, and a few basic tools. My dog seemed to sense the change in plans, wagging his tail excitedly as we set off down the trail. The path was barely visible in the fading light, but I had a good flashlight to guide our way. We hiked for about 15 minutes, moving deeper into the wilderness, before I decided we had gone far enough to avoid detection. Veering off the trail, we made our way to the edge of a small clearing. It was a picturesque spot, with a grassy meadow surrounded by towering pines. In the distance, I could make out the silhouette of mountains against the star-studded sky. Despite the unplanned nature of our campsite, I couldn't help but feel a sense of adventure and connection with nature. Knowing the importance of minimizing our impact on the environment, I carefully selected a spot for our camp. I chose a flat area with minimal vegetation hoping to leave as little trace as possible of our presence. My first task was to dig a small fire pit. Using a collapsible shovel from my pack, I scraped away the top layer of soil and created a circular depression. Next came the tent. I had practiced setting it up in my backyard before the trip, and that practice paid off now as I efficiently assembled our shelter for the night. My dog watched curiously, occasionally sniffing around the perimeter of our makeshift campsite. With the tent up, I turned my attention to dinner. I had packed some hot dogs, thinking they'd be an easy meal to cook over a campfire. As I gathered some small branches and kindling for the fire, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were intruders in this wild place. Every snapping twig or rustling leaf made me pause and look around, half expecting to see a park ranger or wild animal emerging from the darkness. Once the fire was going, I roasted the hot dogs on long sticks. My canine companion sat patiently, his eyes fixed on the sizzling meat. The aroma of cooking food filled the air, and I hoped it wouldn't attract any unwanted visitors. We shared our simple meal, the hot dogs tasting better than any gourmet dish in that moment of hunger and exhaustion. 
After dinner, I meticulously cleaned up our site. I knew the importance of proper food storage in bear country, so I gathered all our leftovers and trash into a bag. Using some rope from my pack, I hung the bag high in a nearby tree, well away from our tent. It was a bit of a struggle in the dark, but I knew it was crucial for our safety. With everything secured, I extinguished the fire, making sure to douse it thoroughly with water from my canteen. I scattered the wet ashes and covered the fire pit with the soil I had initially removed, trying to erase any evidence of our presence. Exhausted from the long day of driving and the unexpected hike, I crawled into the tent with my dog. The lightweight sleeping bag provided welcome warmth against the cool night air. As I lay there, listening to the gentle rustling of leaves and the occasional hoot of an owl, I felt a mix of emotions, excitement at the adventure, a twinge of guilt for camping in an unauthorized area, and a hint of apprehension about what the night might bring. Sleep came quickly, but it was destined to be a night of interruptions. I'm not sure how long I had been asleep when the first howl pierced the night. At first it sounded distant, maybe a few miles away. In my groggy state, I marveled at the haunting beauty of the sound. It was a reminder that we were in true wilderness, sharing the land with its wild inhabitants. As I started to drift back to sleep, another howl rang out, this time noticeably closer. My dog, who had been sleeping soundly at my feet, raised his head, ears perked in alert curiosity. I patted him reassuringly, trying to convey a calmness I didn't entirely feel. The howls continued, each time seeming to come from a different direction and growing ever closer. It was hard to judge distance in the dark, unfamiliar terrain, but I estimated that the wolves were now at the edge of the meadow where we were camped. My mind raced, trying to recall everything I knew about wolf behavior. I knew attacks on humans were extremely rare, but that did little to calm my racing heart. Soon, the sounds of padding feet and sniffing noses circled our tent. I lay perfectly still, hardly daring to breathe. My dog, to his credit, remained silent, though I could feel him trembling slightly against my leg. The wolves seemed curious, investigating this strange new object in their territory. Those minutes felt like hours as we waited, hoping the wolves would lose interest and move on. Finally, after what seemed an eternity, the sounds began to recede. A distant howl signaled that the pack was moving away, and I let out a breath I hadn't realized I'd been holding. As the adrenaline subsided, exhaustion took over once more and I drifted back to sleep. The next time I awoke, the sky outside was still dark, but I had the sense that several hours had passed. This time, however, the sounds that roused me were very different. Heavy footfalls circled the tent, accompanied by deep, huffing breaths. My first thought was bare, and a jolt of fear shot through me. While wolves were unlikely to attack, a hungry or curious bear could easily see our tent as something to investigate more thoroughly. The unseen visitor seemed particularly interested in the spot where I had buried the fire pit. I silently cursed myself for not being more thorough in cleaning up. Even the faintest scent of food could attract a bear's keen nose. After nosing around the fire pit area, the bear turned its attention to our tent. Each lumbering step it took sent vibrations through the ground, emphasizing its massive size. As it circled closer, I knew I had to do something to deter it without provoking an attack. With trembling hands, I reached for my flashlight. Taking a deep breath to steady myself, I flicked it on, illuminating the tent from within. The sudden appearance of the glowing dome seemed to startle the bear. I heard a surprised huff, followed by the sound of retreating footsteps. Even after the sounds of the bear faded away, sleep eluded me. Every rustle of leaves or snap of a twig brought me to full alert. As the sky began to lighten with the approaching dawn, I finally felt it was safe enough to peer outside. Unzipping the tent cautiously, I stuck my head out and surveyed our surroundings. The meadow was peaceful in the early morning light, with no sign of our nighttime visitors. A light rain had begun to fall, 
adding a misty quality to the scene that would have been beautiful under different circumstances. Knowing we needed to leave quickly, I began packing up our campsite. The rain made everything damp, adding to the challenge of breaking camp. My dog seemed eager to be on the move, perhaps still unsettled by the night's events. We hiked back to the trailhead in record time, my pace quickened by the desire to return to the relative safety of populated areas. As we drove away from the parking lot, I felt a mixture of relief and lingering excitement from our wilderness encounter. Luck was finally on our side as we found a campground with a vacancy that morning. As I was setting up my damp tent to dry, a park ranger approached, clipboard in hand. He asked about my previous night's accommodation, mentioning they had a record of my entry but no registered campsite. In a moment of panic, I lied, claiming I had slept in my truck in a parking lot. The ranger seemed skeptical but didn't press the issue, simply reminding me of the park's camping regulations and moving on. I felt a twinge of guilt for the deception but was relieved to avoid any potential fines or reprimands. The rest of our time in Yellowstone was, thankfully, far less eventful. We spent our days exploring the park's famous attractions, watching Old Faithful erupt, marveling at the colorful hot springs, and observing herds of bison from a safe distance. Each night, I made sure we were safely checked into an official campsite well before dark. As our time in the park came to an end, we hit the road again, heading west towards Portland, Oregon. The journey took us through changing landscapes, from the rugged mountains of Idaho to the high desert of eastern Oregon, and finally into the lush greenery of the Pacific Northwest. We took our time, stopping at various campsites along the way. Each night as I set up our tent in designated camping areas, I couldn't help but reflect on our Yellowstone adventure. While it had been frightening at times, it had also given me a profound respect for the wild places and creatures we share this planet with. Arriving in Portland felt like the end of an epic journey. The city's quirky charm and abundant green spaces were a welcoming sight after so many days on the road. We spent a week exploring the city and its surroundings, hiking in the Columbia River Gorge and along the Oregon coast. As I sat in a Portland coffee shop on our last day, planning the next leg of our journey, I couldn't help but smile at the memory of that night in Yellowstone. It had been unplanned, uncomfortable, and at times terrifying, but it was also an experience I would never forget. It had taught me about my own resilience, the unpredictability of nature, and the importance of respecting wildlife and wilderness areas. That night in Yellowstone, while not the comfortable camping experience I had initially planned, had become the defining moment of our cross-country adventure. It was a reminder that sometimes the most memorable experiences come from the unexpected turns in our journey, and that nature, in all its beauty and wildness, deserves our respect and admiration. As we prepared to leave Portland and continue our journey, I felt a renewed sense of excitement for the road ahead. Whatever challenges or adventures awaited us, I knew we were ready to face them. My loyal dog and I, two travelers making our way across this vast and beautiful country. It was a crisp autumn evening when my wife and I decided to embark on a camping trip, seeking respite from our hectic urban lives. We had been planning this getaway for weeks, carefully selecting a remote location nestled deep within the heart of the National Forest. The drive to our chosen campsite was long but scenic, winding through dense woods and alongside babbling streams. As we arrived at our destination, the sun was already beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows across the forest floor. We quickly set about pitching our tent, a sturdy four-season model we had invested in for occasions just like this. The air was filled with the earthy scent of pine needles and damp soil, a refreshing change from the city's pollution. Once our temporary home was erected, we gathered firewood and kindling from the surrounding area, 
being careful to only collect fallen branches as per the park regulations. I prided myself on my fire starting skills, and soon we had a cheerful blaze crackling before us, its warm glow pushing back the encroaching darkness. We sat around the campfire, our faces illuminated by the dancing flames. My wife and I engaged in pleasant conversation, discussing our plans for the coming days, hikes we wanted to take, landmarks we hoped to see. It was a rare moment of peace and connection, away from the constant notifications and demands of our everyday lives. As we talked, we shared a simple but satisfying meal of campfire roasted potatoes and grilled sausages, savoring the smoky flavor that only outdoor cooking can provide. The night air was cool, but not uncomfortably so, and we were content in our little bubble of warmth and light. Suddenly, without warning, the weather took a dramatic turn. The skies opened up and rain began to pour down with an intensity that caught us both off guard. We scrambled to save our food and supplies, quickly retreating to the safety of our tent. The downpour was so heavy that it drowned out all other sounds, creating a constant, almost deafening pitter-patter as countless droplets struck the canvas above our heads. Realizing that our evening by the fire had come to an abrupt end, we decided to make the best of the situation. We changed into dry clothes, our movements awkward in the confined space of the tent. The rain showed no signs of letting up, so we resigned ourselves to calling it an early night. We slipped into our sleeping bags, the soft rustle of nylon against nylon barely audible over the relentless rain. I reached out to turn off our battery-powered lantern, plunging the tent into darkness. The rain continued its assault, creating an oddly soothing white noise that I thought might lull us to sleep. But then, piercing through the monotonous sound of rainfall, we heard something else. It was a strange, electronic-sounding noise, a sort of bleat-bleat that reminded me of the low battery warning on an old Motorola phone. My wife and I exchanged puzzled glances in the darkness, both of us instantly alert. The sound was unsettling for several reasons. Firstly, we didn't own any devices that made such a noise. Secondly, we had turned off our phones to conserve battery life and fully disconnect from the world. And most importantly, we were miles from the nearest campsite or road. Who or what could be making that sound out here, in the middle of nowhere, in this downpour? We lay perfectly still, straining our ears. The rain made it impossible to discern if anyone was approaching our tent. The realization that we were effectively trapped in this canvas shelter with only one exit began to sink in. A creeping sense of vulnerability washed over us. Minutes stretched into what felt like hours as we remained frozen in place, barely daring to breathe. My mind raced through possible explanations and potential courses of action. Was it an animal? Another camper who had gotten lost? Or was it something more sinister? Eventually, the tension became unbearable. I knew I had to do something, if only to put our minds at ease. I whispered to my wife that I was going to check outside. She nodded her eyes wide with a mixture of fear and concern. With trembling hands, I reached for the small handgun I had brought for protection against wildlife. I never thought I'd actually need to use it, but in that moment I was grateful for its reassuring weight. I also grabbed our flashlight, its beam a pitiful defense against the unknown darkness outside. Taking a deep breath, I made a dash for the tent's entrance. I unzipped it as quickly as I could half expecting to come face to face with some nightmarish figure. Instead, I was greeted by a wall of rain and impenetrable darkness beyond the reach of my flashlight. Ignoring the rain soaking through my clothes, I circled our tent, sweeping the area with the flashlight beam. My heart pounded in my chest, adrenaline coursing through my veins. But there was nothing, no sign of anyone or anything that could have made the strange noise. The surrounding forest was still, save for the constant drumming of rain on leaves. I returned to the tent, soaked to the bone and shivering, but somewhat relieved. I reported my findings, or lack thereof, to my wife. However, the unsettling experience had shaken us both. The thought of spending the rest of the night in this isolated spot 
wondering if the mysterious noise would return was too much to bear. We made a quick decision to abandon our campsite. Hastily, we gathered our most valuable possessions, wallets, phones, car keys, and prepared to make a break for it. The walk to our car, which we had left at a small parking area about 10 minutes away, now seemed like a daunting journey. With me leading the way, flashlight in one hand and gun in the other, we set out into the rainy night. The forest path, which had seemed so inviting during the day, now felt treacherous and foreboding. Every shadow seemed to move, every rustle of leaves made us jump. The rain continued unabated, reducing visibility and turning the ground into a slippery mess. After what felt like an eternity, we finally reached our car. We practically dove inside, locking the doors immediately. Only then did we allow ourselves to breathe a sigh of relief. The familiar interior of our vehicle felt like a sanctuary after the unsettling events at the campsite. We sat there for a few moments, water dripping from our clothes onto the seats, as we debated what to do next. The sensible thing would have been to inform the park rangers about our experience. However, the thought of staying in the area any longer than necessary was unappealing. In the end, we decided to drive home, a journey of about an hour. The drive was tense and quiet, both of us lost in our own thoughts about what had transpired. We arrived home in the early hours of the morning, exhausted but grateful for the safety and comfort of our apartment. After a few hours of fitful sleep, we woke to find the sun shining brightly, as if mocking the terror of the previous night. In the light of day, our fears seemed somewhat overblown. We began to rationalize the experience. Perhaps it was just an animal, or maybe our tired minds had played tricks on us. Regardless, we knew we had to return to the campsite to retrieve the rest of our belongings. So, after a hearty breakfast and several cups of strong coffee, we set out once again for the forest. The drive back was surreal. The same road that had seemed so ominous in the dark now appeared picturesque and inviting. We arrived at the parking area and made the short hike to our campsite, half expecting to find it ransacked or disturbed in some way. To our surprise, Everything was exactly as we had left it. Our tent stood undisturbed, our remaining possessions inside untouched. There were no footprints in the mud around the campsite, no signs that anyone or anything had been there in our absence. We packed up our gear efficiently, eager to put this place behind us. As we worked, we discussed the events of the night before, trying to make sense of what had happened. Had we overreacted? Was there a logical explanation for the strange noise we'd heard? It wasn't until we got home and began unpacking that we discovered something truly unsettling. As my wife sorted through her belongings, she realized that all of her underwear was missing. Not a single pair remained among her clothes. We were dumbfounded. We double-checked all our bags, searched the car, and even called the campground office to see if anything had been turned in. Nothing. The underwear had simply vanished. This discovery sent a chill down our spines. It proved that our experience hadn't been a mere figment of our imaginations. Someone had indeed been at our campsite that night. Someone who had managed to enter our tent and remove specific items without disturbing anything else. The implications were terrifying. Who was this person? How long had they been watching us? What were their intentions? And most disturbingly, what might have happened if we hadn't left when we did? In the days that followed, we reported the incident to both the park rangers and the local police. They took our statement seriously, but admitted that without more evidence, there wasn't much they could do. They promised to increase patrols in the area and advised other campers to be cautious. The experience left a lasting impact on us. We found ourselves jumpy and paranoid for weeks afterward, startling at small noises and double-checking the locks on our doors and windows. Our enthusiasm for camping waned significantly, and it would be a long time before we felt comfortable sleeping in a tent again. Looking back on that night, I'm grateful that we trusted our instincts and left when we did. 
The thought of what might have happened had we stayed still sends shivers down my spine. It serves as a stark reminder that even in seemingly peaceful and isolated places, danger can lurk. We never did get a satisfactory explanation for what happened that night. The mysterious noise, the missing underwear, it all remains a disturbing puzzle. But one thing is certain, our perception of safety in the great outdoors has been forever altered. We learned the hard way that sometimes the most unsettling threats are the ones we can't see, hiding just beyond the reach of our flashlight beams, waiting in the darkness. In the weeks that followed, we found ourselves constantly replaying the events of that night in our minds, searching for any detail we might have missed. We scoured local news reports, hoping to find similar incidents that might shed light on our experience. But there was nothing. The incident had a profound effect on our relationship as well. On one hand, it brought us closer together, having shared such an intense and frightening experience. We found ourselves more appreciative of each other, more aware of the fragility of our safety and peace of mind. On the other hand, it introduced a new element of tension. We became more protective of each other, sometimes to the point of being overbearing. Our friends and family noticed the change in us. We were more reserved, less likely to venture out for social gatherings, especially after dark. When we did share our story, we were met with a mix of concern, skepticism, and morbid curiosity. Some suggested we might have imagined it all, a product of overactive imaginations fueled by too many horror movies. Others urged us to pursue the matter further, convinced that there must be more to the story. Driven by a need for closure, we decided to do some investigating of our own. We reached out to other campers who had stayed in the same area around the time of our incident. Most had uneventful stays, but a few reported strange occurrences, unexplained noises, items going missing, an unsettling feeling of being watched. While none of these accounts matched the severity of our experience, they suggested that we weren't alone in our unease. We also delved into the history of the area, wondering if there might be some local legend or past event that could explain what had happened. We uncovered stories of an old hermit who had once lived in those woods, a man who had retreated from society after suffering some unnamed trauma. Some locals claimed he still roamed the forest, harmless but eccentric. Others spoke of more sinister figures, poachers who operated in the area, or criminals who used the remote location to hide from the law. As time passed, the intensity of our fear began to fade, replaced by a deep-seated caution and a newfound respect for the unpredictability of nature, both human and wild. We started to venture out again, but our approach to outdoor activities had changed dramatically. We invested in high-tech security devices for camping motion sensors, wireless cameras, personal alarms. Our preparations became almost militaristic in their thoroughness. Slowly, we began to reclaim our love for the outdoors. Our first camping trip after the incident was a nerve-wracking experience. We chose a popular, well-patrolled campground, far from the site of our previous adventure. We barely slept that first night, jumping at every sound. But as the sun rose the next morning, we felt a sense of victory. We had faced our fears and survived. Over time, we expanded our comfort zone, gradually venturing into more remote areas. Each successful trip helped to rebuild our confidence. We even considered returning to the site of our fateful night, a sort of pilgrimage to confront our lingering fears. In the end, we decided against it. Some memories we felt were better left undisturbed. The incident changed us in ways we never expected. We became more aware of our surroundings, more attuned to the subtle signs of danger that we might have previously ignored. This heightened awareness extended beyond our outdoor adventures into our daily lives. We found ourselves more cautious in urban settings as well, more conscious of the potential threats that lurk in even the most familiar environments. Our experience also sparked a passion for advocacy. We became involved in camping safety initiatives, 
sharing our story as a cautionary tale, and working to promote better security measures in national parks and forests. We connected with other survivors of similar incidents, finding solace and strength in shared experiences. As the years passed, the memory of that night remained vivid, but its power over us diminished. We came to see it not just as a traumatic event, but as a pivotal moment that had reshaped our lives in both challenging and ultimately positive ways. It had tested our resilience, strengthened our bond, and given us a new perspective on life. Looking back now, I realize that the true horror of that night wasn't just the unknown threat we faced, but the sudden shattering of our sense of security. We had ventured into nature seeking peace and connection, only to be confronted with the harsh reality that danger can find us anywhere. Yet in facing that danger, in choosing to confront our fears rather than be ruled by them, we discovered a strength we didn't know we possessed. The mystery of what really happened that night in the forest remains unsolved. Perhaps it will always be so, but in a way, the lack of resolution has become a part of our story, a reminder that life is full of uncertainties and that true courage lies in how we face them. As I sit here, years removed from that rainy night in the forest, I can't help but feel a mix of emotions. There's still a flicker of fear when I recall the sound that pierced the darkness, still a chill when I think of the missing items we discovered but there's also a sense of pride in how we've grown from the experience, how we've refused to let fear dictate our lives. Our camping gear still sits in our garage, well-maintained and ready for the next adventure. And while we may approach the wilderness with more caution now, we haven't lost our love for its beauty and serenity. If anything, our appreciation has deepened, tempered by the knowledge of both its wonders and its dangers. In the end, perhaps that's the most important lesson we learned from our unsettling encounter in the forest. Life, like nature, is full of unknowns. We can't always control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond. And sometimes, it's in facing our deepest fears that we discover our greatest strengths. As night falls and I hear the distant call of wilderness through our open window, I no longer feel just fear. Instead, I feel a complex mixture of respect, caution, and an enduring sense of wonder. The forest may hide its secrets, but it also holds the promise of discovery, of connection, of adventures yet to come. And armed with the wisdom of our experience, we're ready to embrace whatever lies ahead, in the wilderness and in life. It was late April of 2003 when I found myself in a cabin just outside of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. I'd come to the woods for a break from my job in Chicago, where I worked as a software engineer. I wasn't your typical city guy, though. Grew up in a small town, spent most of my teenage years hunting with my dad, and had always preferred the quiet of the outdoors to the constant noise of the city. The cabin was old, built in the 1950s, with creaky floorboards and the smell of pine and wood smoke clinging to everything. I rented it from an old friend who'd moved to California years ago and hadn't bothered to visit it since. He told me to expect some quirks. The plumbing was old, the heating unreliable, but I didn't mind. All I wanted was some time alone, to think, to breathe. As I pulled up to the cabin in my beat-up Honda Civic, the gravel crunching under the tires, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. The past few months in Chicago had been brutal. Long hours at the office, endless meetings, and the constant pressure to meet deadlines. Here, surrounded by towering pines and the gentle lapping of Lake Superior in the distance, I felt like I could finally exhale. The cabin itself was nothing special a simple A-frame structure with a small porch out front. The dark wood exterior had seen better days, with patches of moss growing on the north-facing side. I grabbed my duffel bag from the trunk and made my way inside. 
the old key turning stiffly in the lock. The interior was just as rustic as I'd expected. A small living area with a worn leather couch faced a stone fireplace. The kitchenette to the left was basic, a small fridge, a two-burner stove, and a sink that had definitely seen better days. A narrow staircase led up to a loft area where I could see the edge of a double bed. It wasn't much, but it was exactly what I needed. I spent the first day just settling in, unpacking my groceries and the stack of books I'd brought along. There was no TV and my phone barely had a signal, which suited me just fine. I'd brought my laptop, but I'd promised myself I wouldn't check my work email. This was about disconnecting, about reconnecting with myself and the natural world around me. That evening, I sat on the porch with a cold beer, watching the sun set through the trees. The forest came alive with the sounds of night, the hooting of an owl, the rustle of small animals in the underbrush. It was peaceful, serene. I felt the tension of the past few months start to melt away. The next morning I woke early, the sunlight streaming through the small windows of the loft. After a quick breakfast of instant coffee and a granola bar, I decided to explore the area around the cabin. The air was crisp, with just a hint of the coming summer. I followed a narrow trail that wound its way through the woods, occasionally stopping to admire a particularly impressive tree or to watch a chipmunk scurry across my path. About a mile from the cabin, I came across a small stream. The water burbled over moss-covered rocks, creating a soothing white noise that seemed to wash away any lingering thoughts of work or the city. I sat on a fallen log, pulled out the paperback I'd brought along, a well-worn copy of Thoreau's Walden, and lost myself in the words and the wilderness around me. It was late afternoon by the time I made my way back to the cabin. As I approached, I noticed something odd. The door, which I was certain I'd closed, was slightly ajar. A chill ran down my spine, despite the warmth of the day. I approached cautiously, straining my ears for any sound of an intruder. The cabin was empty, but things weren't quite as I'd left them. My duffel bag, which I'd left at the foot of the bed in the loft, was now on the couch. The books I'd stacked neatly on the small coffee table were scattered, some on the floor, and there, on the kitchen counter, was a single muddy footprint, far larger than my own. I stood there for a long moment, my heart pounding in my chest. Had someone broken in? But nothing seemed to be missing. My wallet, which I'd foolishly left on the nightstand, was untouched. My laptop was still in its bag. It didn't make sense. I considered calling the local police, but what would I tell them? that someone had come into the cabin, moved my things around, and left without taking anything. And even if I wanted to, my phone still had no signal. I was on my own. That night, I double-checked every window, every door. I even dragged the heavy wooden chair from the kitchenette and propped it under the doorknob, an old trick I'd learned from my paranoid uncle years ago. Sleep didn't come easily, every creak of the cabin settling. Every rustle of wind through the trees outside had me bolt upright, straining my ears for any sign of an intruder. The third day dawned gray and overcast, a light drizzle tapping against the roof of the cabin. I'd managed to doze off sometime in the early hours of the morning, and I woke feeling groggy and on edge. The events of the previous day felt somehow distant, like a half-remembered dream. In the light of day, I almost managed to convince myself that I'd imagined it all. The open door, the moved belongings, the muddy footprint. Almost. I spent most of the day inside, alternating between reading and staring out the window at the misty woods beyond. As evening approached, the rain let up, and I decided to step out onto the porch for some fresh air. The forest was eerily quiet, the usual chorus of birds and insects muted by the recent rainfall. That's when I heard it. A crash in the woods, like something heavy falling or being thrown. At first I thought it might be a tree limb, weakened by the rain and finally giving way. 
But then I heard it again, closer this time, and again, closer still. Whatever was making the noise, it was big, much bigger than any deer or bear I'd encountered in my years of hunting, and it was moving with purpose, heading straight for the cabin. I hurried inside, my heart racing. I grabbed the hunting knife I'd brought along, more out of habit than any expectation of needing it, and stood by the window, peering out into the gathering darkness. For a long moment there was nothing, just the soft patter of raindrops on leaves and the pounding of my own heart in my ears. Then at the edge of the clearing something moved. At first I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. It was like my brain couldn't process the information my eyes were sending it. The shape was all wrong, too big to be a bear, too misshapen to be any animal I'd ever encountered. It moved on all fours, but its gait was uneven, almost lurching. And its eyes, God, its eyes, they reflected the faint porch light like twin flames in the darkness. I stood there, frozen as the thing made its way across the clearing towards the cabin. It moved slowly, almost cautiously, its massive head swinging from side to side as if scenting the air. As it got closer, I could make out more details, each one more horrifying than the last. Its body was covered in a thick, matted fur, but patches were missing, revealing skin that looked wrong. Too smooth in some places, ridged and scarred in others. Its front limbs ended in massive, curved claws that dug into the soft earth with each step. But it was the face that truly chilled me to my core. It was like someone had tried to create a bear from description alone and gotten everything subtly, terrifyingly wrong. The snout was too long, the teeth too numerous and sharp. And those eyes, they held an intelligence that no animal should possess. The creature stopped about 20 feet from the cabin, its head raised, staring directly at me through the window. I don't know how long we stood there, locked in that moment. It could have been seconds or hours. Then, slowly, deliberately, it opened its mouth. What came out wasn't a roar or a growl. It was a sound I'd never heard before and hoped never to hear again a low, guttural noise that seemed to vibrate in my very bones. And then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it turned and lumbered back into the woods, leaving nothing but massive, misshapen footprints in the muddy ground. I didn't sleep that night. I sat in the old armchair, my hunting knife in one hand, a flashlight in the other, jumping at every sound. As the first light of dawn began to filter through the trees, I made a decision. I was leaving. Whatever that thing was, whatever was happening in these woods, I wanted no part of it. I threw my belongings haphazardly into my duffel bag, not bothering to fold anything. As I was loading up my car, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. There, in the mud by the porch steps, was a single footprint. It matched the ones I'd seen the creature leave the night before. But this one was facing the cabin, not away from it. The thing had come right up to the porch while I was inside. I got in my car and drove, not even bothering to lock up the cabin behind me. As I sped down the gravel road leading back to civilization, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that somewhere in those dark woods, that thing was following my progress, those unnatural eyes tracking my escape. I've never told anyone the full story of what happened in those woods outside Sault Ste. Marie. Who would believe me? Sometimes, late at night, I managed to convince myself that it was all a dream, a hallucination brought on by stress and isolation. But then I'll catch a glimpse of something moving just at the edge of my vision. Or I'll wake up in a cold sweat, the echo of that unearthly sound ringing in my ears. I don't go camping anymore. I've turned down every invitation to cabins or hiking trips. I tell people I've developed allergies or that I'm too busy with work. The truth is I'm afraid. Afraid that if I go back to the woods, I'll see that thing again. And afraid that this time it won't just watch from a distance. Sometimes when the wind blows just right and carries with it the scent of pine and damp earth, I find myself wondering, is it still out there in those Michigan woods? 
Is it waiting? And if it is, what exactly is it waiting for? But with each mission, each encounter with the impossible, I felt a piece of my old self slipping away. The weight of secrecy, the constant vigilance, the knowledge that each day could be my last. It all took its toll. Now as I sit here recounting this tale, I can't help but wonder about the price of knowledge. Is ignorance truly bliss? Or is there value in facing the darkness head on? in standing as a bulwark between the innocent and the horrors that lurk just beyond their perception. I don't have all the answers, but I do know this. As long as there are things that go bump in the night, as long as there are shadows that threaten to engulf the light, I'll be there. Because someone has to stand on that front line. Someone has to fight the battles that history will never record. And maybe, just maybe, that someone is me. Years have passed since that fateful night in the Smoky Mountains, each one filled with encounters that would shatter most people's sanity. I've seen things that defy explanation, faced creatures that shouldn't exist, and lost more friends than I care to count. But I've also saved lives, protected the innocent, and pushed back against the darkness that threatens to engulf our world. One mission in particular stands out in my mind, a hunt that took us to the icy wilderness of Alaska. We'd received reports of a massive creature terrorizing remote fishing villages along the coast. Locals spoke of an ancient beast, a serpent-like monstrosity that had been part of their legends for generations. Our team consisted of five operatives. Myself, Dr. Chen, who had recovered from her injuries and become one of our top field researchers, a native Alaskan tracker named Akiak, our tech specialist, Miranda Johnson, and a grizzled veteran named Carson, who'd seen more action than the rest of us combined. We set up our base camp on the shores of a mist-shrouded lake, the water black and still as glass. The air was thick with tension and the biting cold of the Arctic night. For days, we scoured the area, following leads and setting up surveillance equipment. But the creature remained elusive, leaving behind only fleeting glimpses on thermal cameras and the occasional scale the size of a dinner plate. It was on our fifth night that all hell broke loose. I was on watch, scanning the shoreline with night vision goggles when I saw it, a massive shape rising from the depths, water cascading off its serpentine body. It was easily 60 feet long, with a head like a crocodile's and eyes that glowed with an otherworldly intelligence. I sounded the alarm, and our camp erupted into action. Carson and Johnson manned our heavy weapons experimental sonic cannons designed to disorient and subdue large cryptids. Dr. Chen rushed to set up our containment equipment, while Akiak and I took up flanking positions with high-powered rifles loaded with tranquilizer rounds potent enough to take down a blue whale. The battle that ensued was like something out of a fever dream. The creature moved with impossible speed for its size, lashing out with a spiked tail that could shatter boulders. Our weapons seemed to barely slow it down, the sonic blasts only serving to enrage it further. Akiak was the first to fall, swept aside by a massive flipper as he tried to get a clear shot. I watched in horror as Johnson, brave and brilliant Johnson, threw herself in front of me as the creature launched one of its barbed spines. The projectile caught her squarely in the chest, and I saw the light fade from her eyes, even as she gave me one last determined smile. Grief and rage fueled me as I emptied my rifle into the beast's hide, each impact leaving welts the size of basketballs, but doing little to slow its rampage. Carson's sonic cannon finally found its mark, the focused sound waves causing the creature to writhe in agony. But as it thrashed, its tail caught Carson, sending him flying into the icy waters of the lake. In that moment, as I watched Carson disappear beneath the waves and heard Dr. Chen's desperate calls for backup, I made a decision that would haunt me for years to come. I grabbed Johnson's fallen sonic cannon, cranked it to maximum power, 
and fired directly at the lake itself. The effect was catastrophic. The water's surface seemed to explode, sending shock waves rippling through the air. The creature let out a deafening shriek of pain and fury before plunging back into the depths, leaving behind a churning maelstrom of froth and blood. As silence fell over the battlefield, I rushed to the water's edge, searching desperately for any sign of Carson. But the lake had become his tomb, its dark waters hiding whatever fate had befallen him. In the aftermath, as we tended to our wounded and mourned our dead, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had only postponed an inevitable confrontation. The creature was wounded, yes, but not defeated. And the cost? The cost had been far too high. That mission marked a turning point for me. I realized that our war against the unknown wasn't just about survival or protecting the public. It was about finding a balance, about understanding these creatures, even as we fought against them because for every mindless beast, there was an entity of ancient intelligence. For every predator, a being simply trying to exist in a world that had forgotten it. Over the years, I've risen through the ranks of our organization. I've gone from field operative to mission coordinator, and finally to a position where I can influence policy and strategy. I've pushed for more research, for attempts at communication with the more intelligent cryptids, for solutions that don't always end in bloodshed. It hasn't been easy. There are those within the organization who see only threats to be eliminated, who would weaponize the very creatures we hunt. But I've also found allies, scientists, diplomats, and even a few reformed cryptids who have chosen to work with us rather than against us. Today, as I look out over the training grounds where a new generation of hunters is being prepared for the battles to come, I feel a mix of pride and trepidation. Pride in how far we've come, in the lives we've saved and the understanding we've gained. But trepidation at the knowledge that our war is far from over. The world is changing, the shadows are growing deeper, and the barriers between our reality and others are becoming increasingly thin. New threats emerge every day, some from the darkest corners of our world, others from realms we're only beginning to understand. But we'll be ready. We'll face whatever comes with courage, wisdom, and the hope that one day, we can build a world where humans and cryptids can coexist in peace. It's a fool's hope, perhaps, but it's what keeps me going, what gives meaning to the sacrifices we've made. As for me, I know my days in the field are numbered. The scars I carry, both physical and mental, are a constant reminder of the toll this life takes. But as long as I'm able, I'll keep fighting. I'll keep pushing for a better way. Because someone has to. Someone has to stand on that line between light and darkness, between the known and the unimaginable. And that someone, well, that someone is still me.